The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. This month, August 25th, Larry Sparks will be doing a Facebook Live with us for our new book. Uh, by the way, this is the new book for such a time as this. An ancient blueprint for the supernatural, the lost teachings of the apostles, and it is for such a time as this. So we thank you, God. Put, add a blessing to it. And also, if you order online, not here, I'm sorry. You're being punished if you're here. Uh, <laughs> but if you order online, you get this book plus an additional free book of your choice, Touching God, or Was Jesus a Capitalist? And uh, if you don't know the answer to that, for sure you need the book. Uh, <clears throat> so tell your friends, order online while the supplies last. You'll be getting an additional free book. I believe that we're going to do Practicing the Presence of God, Part 2. I really believe that, uh, that what we're seeing take place are people learning to use their God tools. And again, um, for those of you that are watching uh, by YouTube or either Facebook Live, um, matter of fact, if you watch by Facebook Live and you, you want to forward it to someone, Wait till it comes up the final copy because they have to eliminate all of the worship on the Facebook Live. Uh, so wait till it goes up before you forward it to somebody else. Otherwise, it gets kind of eliminated, I think. But uh, I, don't, I just hope I'm going to repeat it again probably for the third Sunday in a row. And I think by that time you go, I never heard him say that before. For the third time in a row. We are a prophetic church, and for 40, it's 44 years now I've been in ministry. 44 years, I've always stayed abreast of what the consensus of prophetic words are saying. All right? Isn't that good? Yeah. But that's not what our ministry is about. Our ministry is about what do I do in light of the thus saith the Lord? And uh, one time we were doing our book signing for, I believe it was Live Free. Um, we were doing a book signing in, uh, at another church, and, and they, uh, they were up there going and quoting Bob Jones's prophetic word, and there's going to be a billion soul harvest, and we better be ready. And then he went, he had an epiphany. What do you do to get ready? That's our ministry. We were called how-to people, but it's actually much more than that. It's basically how to make ready a people prepared for what the prophets are saying. It's one thing to say, if this is going to happen, that's going to happen. You go, oh, okay. And then what? What do I do? That is a, a, a major uh, emphasis of ours. So we're called the how-to people. You can look at it that way. Uh, how to make ready a people prepare. Actually, John the Baptist had a how-to ministry. Jesus didn't come on the scene yet, but he says, in light of the prophetic words that are going to be fulfilled and the Messiah is going to appear, what do I do now? Tell him to repent. And every major move of God, every good thing that ever happened in Christianity was preceded by a move of repentance. So that part you can do without even knowing. You should just know that that this is a time of personal cleansing and a time of reevaluating uh, some of the things that you've kind of let slide. And I'll tell you what, uh, the book that will take care of that is this, right there. This is a blueprint. And what really, I think it's one of the most important books we've, we've written is because in light of what we discovered with the Didache, when we are hungering and thirsting after, what do we do now? 
What if there is a billion soul harvest? Do you realize these people are going to come in unchurched, clueless? You know, in the early church, when the Gentiles got saved, you know, the Romans, the Jews, nobody would have cared. Uh, the Gentiles wouldn't have cared if it was just add another, add, add that Jesus to our other gods. They wouldn't have suffered any persecution. But it wasn't that. All of a sudden, this is, no, this is the God that made you. This is the God of gods. All those other are false gods. That's what turned the world upside down, and that's what turned even the resistance of that message on them. But this, for such a time as this, my epiphany, before we wrote this, and when we started looking into the Didache, the lost teachings of the apostles to the Gentiles, it was Jewish believers in Messiah who suddenly saw that Gentiles can get saved, but these Gentiles were clueless. They needed a plan, and the Didache has been proven that that is the teaching that the apostles used before we had a New Testament. They had to teach these Gentiles something, and the Didache laid that. And what God showed me, my epiphany was, it's the same right now. If suddenly the way our culture has brainwashed people to a lack of morals, that if right now a billion soul harvest around the world and in the United States, I'll tell you what, you're going to need some kind of a program, some type of an outline, for these people are going to be clueless. They're not raised in the church, and even the ones raised in the church need it because they've let it water down to next to nothing. So now, how to, and I, I feel like this, this, is, this sums up our ministry long be before they called us a how-to people. We were getting emails when we used to travel. 12 years we traveled church to church and we would get emails and there was a commonality to the perceptive people that emailed us. You know what they'd say? And we heard this way more than once. These were biblically literate people who had been in the church for 20, 30 years. They emailed us and said, finally, here's someone telling us how to do what biblically we already knew we were supposed to do. So that means they were biblically literate, they knew what the Bible said, but how in the world do you do that? And, and so this combined with how-to, our how-tos, to break it down to someone that's new, that doesn't understand Christianese particularly, and what's right and what's wrong, mixed with a plan to take them steadily and progressively into a deeper relationship with God. So um, I want to talk about some of those how-tos I did last week on how to practice the presence of God. Uh, matter of fact, we were talking with Sid Roth, and, we, and he said it, it was just like him and many others. When they read Brother Lawrence, how many have ever heard of Brother Lawrence, 16th century monk? who practiced the presence of God, everybody says, that's wonderful, Brother Lawrence was able to practice the presence of God. And everything he did, he did it as a love unto God. If he picked up a piece of straw from the ground, it was in his love and devotion to God. And then they said, how do you do that? How do you do that? That is a missing element. And I think, in a sense, it's even Old Testament uh, understanding of that would be like the tribe of Issachar. The tribes had different giftings, different emphasis, but Issachar knew what Israel ought to do in light of the times that we're living in. And I feel like, in a, in a sense, we've got an Issachar anointing. In other words, what do we do in light of what's going on in a crazy world? And I'm saying to make ready a people prepared, you're going to need something. You're going to have friends that, that weren't raised in church, and even the ones raised in church, if it's been watered down or ignored, they're going to need, they're going to need a rude awakening and say, no, here's what it's all about. And so I really want to encourage everybody, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, um, I really want to encourage you to order the book. And if you order now, you can order from Forgive123. This is the only place you're going to get that. Forgive123. Who couldn't forget? Who couldn't remember that website? Forgive123.com. Okay. On Forgive, there is a special offer. You can order this without the special offer, so you've got to kind of search the, the store. Or you can order the special offer, and you get this and another book of your choosing, either Touching God 
which has been out of print, but we have some left, and it's excellent. Uh, the cover was changed years later and uh, expanded, but uh, Live um, Touching God. And then the other choice is, and I highly recommend this one, is Was Jesus a Capitalist? It covers um, free enterprise versus socialism. And trust me, in this generation, we need that foundation. So look for the special online. You can order this without ordering a special, and you can order this with the special. So search the store for the proper link, all right? I, I feel a thousand copies going out already. I just sense it in my spirit. So anyway, the, an ancient blueprint for the supernatural. And actually, the subtitles are very, very definitive. It says, the lost teachings of the apostles. In other words, what did these Jewish believers in Jesus who had an Old Testament background, they knew the Ten Commandments, they knew right from wrong in many cases, and Jesus actually elevated some of it by the Spirit, and they had to teach Gentiles who were going like, well, I had a baby girl, and I didn't want a girl, I wanted a boy, so I just left the baby out in the cold to die. Oh, you're saying that's wrong. Yeah, that's in the Didache. Don't do that. <laughs> you know? And so that's what I mean by starting from scratch. You don't assume people know right from wrong. You don't assume they know the Bible. You don't assume that because they went to church a lot, they've got a foundation. And so... Uh, I believe for such a time as this, this is going to be proved to be one of the most valuable tools. Long after I'm with Jesus, this is going to be used to disciple that billion soul harvest because they're going to need a plan, not just do it because I said so. Have you ever any, have, had, had anyone tell you, have faith, just believe? Doesn't that frustrate you sometimes? <laughs> just believe. If I, if I could, I, if I knew what you were talking about, I'd do it. <laughs> All right, well, this will show you how to do it, not just what to do. So there. Is that a long commercial? But I'll tell you what, it'll be worth, it, it's worth its weight in gold. It's probably one of the best things we've written for making ready a people prepared for what's coming. So I want to go to part two on practicing the presence of God, but how to learn to practice the presence of God, not just say do it. All right, because... Walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, how do I do that? Huh? It's, it's easy to say, it's easy to give the right answer. It's a whole nother ball game to live it out. And we need the how-tos. You know, the early church, they were so impacted, it was like they had a thousand white light bulb hit them. And there were some things you didn't need explained. But we're going to have a generation coming up that, yeah, the power of God's going to be strong. But they're going to have to be taught right from the beginning, this is right and this is wrong. And we don't care what you've done your whole life that you thought was okay. It's not okay. And God's going to do beforehand, before a tremendous outpouring and before a tremendous harvest, there is going to be a move of repentance as well for the church. Because you've got to have a vessel that is equipped to mentor such a harvest. And what are you going to, how are you going to mentor this harvest? I still remember when we were doing that book signing. That pastor had an epiphany. He goes, and then there's going to be a billion soul harvest, and then we've got to be ready to do. And after this long pause, he said, I think maybe you ought to get Dennis and Jennifer's book because <laughs> we were doing a book signing that day. And, it, and actually, that was a perceptive answer because there's how-tos in all of our books. But this one is going to lay out a plan. So... Anyway, if we're going to continue to learn to practice the presence of God, um, <clears throat> one of the first things that we learned in, uh, in part one was location. Location, location, location. We found the best training for Jennifer and I was the 12 years we traveled church to church. You know, if you're a pastor out there and you pastor just your church and you haven't really seen what's going on in the rest of the body, you don't really have a clear perspective of what's going on in the body. You go church to church and your eyes are opened. You see strengths. You see weaknesses. You see repetitive problems that need a remedy. And if you've got the tools to remedy that, preach it, teach it, and show other people how. 
And I'd say most of, our, most of our literature was written in light of an emphasis of what we saw as in quality, well-taught churches, there were still weaknesses. We have weaknesses. We have strengths. Our weakness is probably, in, instead of a deeper work of the cross, you, you're, you're, you're basically be trying to get a healing on something. Get a healing, but also realize that it's the deeper work of the cross that draws you closer to God. All right, because you can use healing as an excuse for everything. Oh, I must need emotional healing on this. I must need emotional healing. Yeah, everything is not an emotional healing unless you pursue a deeper, richer, fuller work of the cross. All right? The strength is we can tell you how to do it, and there's going to be a course online pretty soon, right, Jason? Um, module, it's going to be our Module 5. We've had four modules that people have been trained. Module 5 is 13 teachings on troubleshooting. That means if you already know the how-tos, you're going to be able to troubleshoot. And I'm so impressed is... Uh, there's nine of us that meet on Sunday, for the most part, all of my pastors. I have yet to have them not be able to give the same answer that I would give. You know how fulfilling that is? That, I mean, hearing them give an answer to somebody, whether it's on the telephone, it's a total stranger or a church member. I am so impressed that uh, basically they've been mentored and well taught, and they've really received everything that we've taught for the for the decades of our teaching and I've rarely found them to say something that I could add to because it's basically that is sufficient that is such a good feeling and knowing that we could have a congregation that if there was a, a major influx of of new believers that you individually could do the same thing you'd be shocked uh, I, I don't think it even caught on in the early years I would tell the church you would be shocked and how many people, even some big names, that you could give some tools to, and then be surprised that it worked. When we traveled, we sat with, uh, in the green room with many big names, and we blew a lot of them out of the water with simple how-tos that you take for granted. So do something with it. Help somebody. You have more potential than you know. So, the scripture that we saw that really summed up a lot of what we're teaching on, how to practice the presence of God, well, we have simple prayer, we have the 60-day challenge, all of those are not to be read. Every now and then I'll run into someone who just reads it and go, I took the 60-day challenge, I read it. That'd be like saying, I read the Bible, do I have to ask Jesus to come in my heart? I mean, do I have to actually do it, or can I just read it? One person even said, online, there's a short little videos with every day. We had somebody just watch the, uh, what are they, five minutes? Two or, three. two or three minutes. They watched the two or three minute video 60 times, because there's one for every day of the 60 days, and said, I, I took the course. It's like... They didn't pray through nothing. <laughs> they didn't deal with it. They just watched a video. 60 of them. 60 three-minute videos. And they, I took the course. No, that's not it, is it? That's like saying, I read the Bible once. What do you want from me? You know. How about having that word bear witness to your spirit to where when you read it, you're not reading words or ink on a page. You're touching the author himself. Then you're doing something. That's not ink on a page. That's the living word. That's where the, the Spirit of God, you're meeting the author of that ink on the page, and you're meeting him spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. That's totally different. But here's the scripture that kind of sums it up, that when we found it years ago, we said, this is like a, 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 an overlay or a transparency or uh, what, what else could we call that? Just a template. Here is the template of what God wants to do in you, and it's a, a, a familiar verse of Scripture in the King James. In the King James, you would know 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. You would say, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, 
casting down arguments or high things that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But listen to it in the message, because you can literally train somebody with just this one verse. You can show them that they have these, here's the message. It says, we use our powerful God tools. If I was training a, a, a new believer and wanted them to really experience God, I'd say, you've got God tools. Because you don't just hand somebody, here's a book, fix, fix, uh, uh, fix my furnace. Here's a book. Did you read the book? Doesn't mean they're going to fix my furnace, does it? I want to know how to apply the tools to fix my furnace. And the church is desperately in need of how to take the God tools and fix what's necessary in my life and help someone else. We use our powerful God tools for fitting every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. Thought, emotion, and impulse. What's that saying? These God tools are to fit together your thoughts, your emotions, and your choices. Mind, will, and emotions. There's your soul. Your soulish nature, mind, will, and emotions. We're using our powerful God tools to fit together the way you think, the way you feel, and the way you act. And when we fit them together, it will be a structure of a life that is actually shaped by Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Sometimes you need to see a different translation to understand exactly what they're talking about. But that's telling you, rather than just saying the weapons of our warfare, the God tools, are there for bringing thoughts captive, healing emotional wounds. And by the way, you cannot heal, you cannot bring a thought captive if you don't deal with the will and the emotions. If you don't deal with all three, you're not going to win the battle of the thoughts. Matter of fact, next week I want to cover that really carefully. I want to cover the how-tos on how to bring thoughts captive to the obedience of God. It is a necessary agreement because I watch people struggle with thought life that there's really no reason for the struggle. You're, there's, a, there's part of the tools that you're not implementing. Because anybody can struggle with thoughts, but there is a way to where they don't control you. That's bringing it captive. So we're going to cover that next week. But before that, I want you to understand that these God tools, I want to get you as a church to the place where touching God is not just an event. It's a lifestyle to where there is an awareness of touching, 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 touching. That word has been almost removed from the church because they're so afraid. You can't live by your feelings. That is one of the dumbest statements in the church, but it's permeated the church universal. You, I know what they mean by that. Don't live by your carnal feelings. But I want my church and the people that have been ministered to to understand there's three different realms of feelings for heaven's sakes. Don't assume anything. If you stub your toe, that's a physical feeling. You go, ow! <laughs> All right? Did I lose anybody on that? That's a physical feeling. <laughs> You're somebody hurt your feelings. That's emotional. Those are emotional feelings. But when we were worshiping this morning, I could feel the presence of God. That's a spiritual feeling. So when I'm talking about feelings, I'm talking about spirit, and I don't get caught up in this, well, I can't live by your feelings. Some of the deadest Christians are the ones that repeat, you can't live by your feelings, which basically means they probably don't have any, or they've so suppressed them and lived out of their head that they've missed out on supernatural events. And they pride themselves in being a head person. Don't be proud of it. It's destroyed every awakening it's, I mean, not destroyed, but it's worked against every major historical awakening, the head people versus the spirit people. Hmm? There was even a move, what was that woman's name, uh, who basically said, you know what, she didn't have a salvation experience, so she merely said, uh, if you can think it, you got it. Phoebe Palmer, yeah. In other words, mental ascent 
Well, by mental assent, I read my whole Bible. Therefore, I have, because I said so. You see, mental assent is not a transformed Holy Spirit in, encounter. And that man that we saw down in Birmingham, Alabama, that basically was a, an African bishop, had many churches under him, Anglican, he said, here are two people who are basically telling you step by step from your initial encounter with Jesus to the subsequent relationship. See, from the initial encounter. See, touching God was not to be an event. Remember the old song, He Touched Me. And oh, the, you know, they sang that at what? Billy Graham Crusades and stuff. He touched me. It isn't supposed to stop there. And all oh, the joy that floods my soul. That is not for conversion alone as an event. It was meant to be a lifestyle. As you received him, Colossians 2.6, so walk the same way. You should be walking in that. If you're not walking in that, you've allowed the distraction of the mind, the will, the emotions, circumstances to pull you away from that union and that communion. Encounter was not meant to be a... I don't know, I always pictured it like Jennifer. Jennifer, I love you, let's get married. Okay, now, the, I want, uh, Dennis, I want you to spend the rest of your life out on the porch. If I need you, if, if something really tragic happens, I'm going to call you in from the porch and have you come in the house and help me. You don't want a relationship like that. That wouldn't last long. Knowing Jennifer, she'd come and get me. And what's better than a little peck on the cheek? You know something that's better? That's a touch, an embrace. Oh, I want to stay there. What's better than an embrace? What that embrace produces is a oneness and a satisfaction. <gasps> well, what's better than satisfaction? Oh, when you're really satisfied, you want to reciprocate. Oh, yeah. When it's really, really satisfying, you say, oh, I'm going to explode if I don't give it away. You give it away, and I'll tell you what, like a magnet, it'll draw. That's the heart of the Father. Love abounding like the heart of the Father will draw sons unto glory. But you can't bring them or give them something you don't have. My goodness, I'm, this is going to be nine parts if I don't get to it. But touching God is not an event. It was meant to be a way of life. This is how we were meant to live. The secret of abiding is learning. Remember in this church and when we traveled, we saw whole congregations mightily helped. I'm still getting uh, emails from pastors that, that, uh, that we uh, visited in the early years. And they're still saying, our church has been transformed because of this. We're not struggling like we've seen uh, Christians from other churches are struggling. They said, because we've learned that there's two answers to anything that ails you. And that is peace and forgiveness. Forgiveness, get your peace back. And peace is an indication that you are at least walking in the light that you have. And it doesn't mean you don't need more light. It just means that at least you're walking in the light that you have. Isn't that? Peace means everything's functioning right now. And then God will shine his light on something. You might momentarily lose your peace and go, ooh, ah, when you receive it. So you don't have to fight with it. Ooh, turns into ah, and it's that satisfaction. And then you embrace it, and it becomes part of your life. So we want to move from encounter to the subsequent relationship, step by step. Practice makes permanent. Now, what are, when we talk about God tools, we know that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Um, when you forgive, this was a major truth. We travel church to church. Some of the some well-known churches, well-known pastors in the churches, wonderful teachers, but the vast majority struggled with a simple concept of forgiveness. And you know what? You can't be struggling with some of these simple principles because it's clear. If you won't forgive, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. I would say you better learn to do that one right. And how do you know if you've forgiven from the heart and not the head? Peace. 
When something is supernatural, there has to be not an intellectual, but a supernatural exchange. There has to be a no-so here. That's why when people get saved, they even say it. They're giving it away that they already realize that they're a spirit man. A spirit man, spirit woman, from head to toes. When you get saved, many people say, I know that I know. Why do they even say it twice? I know that I know. Because in many cases, their head has accepted what the encounter has done in their knower. All true spiritual knowings are seeing, hearing, touching from the spirit that informs the mind. If you live by your five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, it actually, if you live by the outward senses, it actually gets you to, it's like your bucket is down here in the presence of God, but your five senses go, oh, look at that, look at that over there, oh my, oh my goodness, look at the storm's coming. It can act, your senses can actually draw you away from Him. You give power to what you give attention to. Does that help? Have you ever laid awake at night thinking? Actually, what that's doing is pulling you away from God and your senses. You're in, in, the, in that context, at sleep, your, your mind is going and racing. You're thinking, but you give power to it. How do you give, how do you, what do I do about that? I'm losing sleep and it's getting worse. You give power to what you give attention to. You go to Him. You sink into in order to be clothed. And the law of, we covered this last week, the law of central tendency is what Madame Guyon called it. The law of central tendency is the same as we would understand gravity. And what is it biblically? It would be, I'm laying in bed, my mind's going crazy, and I go, Jesus. Not Jesus up here arguing Jesus with, I know, Jesus, good luck with that. That doesn't work. You don't argue with an argument and win, even with the right answer. You go to the answer, and you go, Jesus, draw nigh unto God. This is how you do that. Draw nigh unto God. Not draw nigh unto God out in heaven. We, we were shocked at how many big churches. We were in churches of a thousand people, and we would say, Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Quick, point to Jesus. You know, What's, what's that saying? It's saying that there, there is a distinct distance in the average Christian's life. If you say, Jesus in you, the hope of glory, where's Jesus? And they point to heaven. There's something wrong with your relationship. You're, you're making long distance phone calls when it's local. <laughs> it's a, but you draw nigh unto God, he draws nigh unto you. You give power to what you give attention to. You give attention to the Jesus in you. And I'll tell you what, that thought loses its power. You give power to what you give attention to. Focus. You have the capacity to focus. Now, when you forgive, I'm going to cover just some of what we call God tools. Now, here's some of the, the tools you probably learned over the years, no matter what church you went to. The blood of Jesus, right? Many people say, I plead the blood, I plead the blood. I would rather just receive forgiveness and let the blood wash away. Pleading it is saying it. That's good. But I have more confidence in knowing that if I've received forgiveness, the remission of sin is a supernatural encounter. I want to do more than say the right answer. I want to have an encounter that transformed. And how will I know if the, pleading the blood of Jesus over a situation, how do I know if it really, if my words have any power behind it? There will be peace. Then the word has the proper source behind the word. The illustration we used to use all the time was somebody quote, who's real good at quoting scripture. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. You're saying the right answer, but you're missing an encounter, aren't you? You're actually fortifying the fear. You need to remove the power. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. It's not the words, it's the power in the words. Here's something, if you're a note taker and if you're watching, 
If you wrote this down, this would straighten out a whole lot of your thinking. And I want to cover thinking next week. Every word that comes out of your mouth, this is for all you people who really know your Bible well and you really like to confess the word, pray the word, that's all good. But every word that comes out of your mouth has a line of communication, you know, specific words like bless you, bless you, two words, bless you. Every word that comes out of your mouth has a line of authority. Bless you can be, an unsaved person can say bless you. There's no anointing on it. There's unsaved people that could say bless you, but the authority on it is not Jesus if they're not saved. Are you catching on yet? That it's not just the words, it's the power attached to the words. A line of authority and a line of communication. Head people just pride themselves on saying all the right answers all the time, but they're an emotional mess. You know what that tells me? The power behind your words weren't, you, you lacked the encounter. You needed to have the peace of God and encounter behind God so that the power behind the words, life and death are in the power of the tongue. And when I used to ask people, what does that mean? They'd say words. <sighs> power is the emphasis, the power of the tongue. It's the power behind the words. If you don't deal with that, the words, well, you know, old time, school, old time training, you know what they used to do? If you just said it over and over, if you just confessed the word over and over again, all right? And you know what? That can work in time, but you know how it works? That's really the hard way. To say it over and over and over again is really the hard way because it's like water wearing down a rock. You know what actually happens? Eventually you believe it. <laughs> almost by accident because you said it so many times you actually believe it and then whoa that worked then you form a theory that you have to work really hard at it because it worked for you one time like that well how about instead of going around the mountain 30 times how about just going to Jesus <laughs> the author of that word meet him embrace him and then speak it out from that place of anointing Grace is always available. It's you who have gone and made an attempt to work it out. But it is God who is at work both, say both with me, both to will and to perform. So your performance, eh, you know, we, we taught people to forgive and they, they were upset that it was too easy. So we said, well, go outside, run around the building three times, work, you know, work it off. That's too easy. Forgiveness is instant. Salvation is instant. Doesn't mean you are, in, there's no instant maturity, but there is an instant work of conversion. And if you're not happy with that, it's too easy, then go run around the building or something, earn it. I don't know what to tell you. Some people just like it hard. Wow. The blood of Jesus is a God tool. And all scriptures given to us for inspiration, doctrine, reproof, correction. The other God tool is knowing where the door of the heart is. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. When you got saved, he didn't stand up here and knock on your head and go, let me in. Whether you knew it or not, you were, you were in some kind of a preparation going, oh, I think I need that Jesus. I, th I, I, I heard what they said. Uh, uh, and then you go, uh, it probably relaxed and flung open the door, whether you knew you did it or not. Huh? You surrendered, even if you didn't know what surrender was. Somehow you did it right. But the door of the heart is here. And you open the door. Oh, oh no, I could feel something. Oh, don't say that word feel. You're in the church now. We don't live by our feelings. Oh, but I feel, oh, that's okay. Just play it down. Pretty soon you'll be like the rest of us. Just calm down. Don't get too excited about your Christianity. You'll be like the rest of us in no time if we can help you, <laughs> right? The door of the heart, forgiveness, focus. 
spiritual touching, seeing, and hearing takes place here and goes up. And you've been taught, oh, I got it in my head. I got to get it down into my spirit. No, it's you need to get it in your spirit and then inform your head. It's called subordination. It's called subordinating to the Lordship of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule. When peace rules, Jesus is ruling. And you can't have peace ruling and Jesus not be ruling. <laughs> You can't be upset and stressed and say Jesus is Lord, because he's not, not at that moment. You can't trust God and be stressed at the same exact time. Discernment. Oh my goodness, I don't even want to talk, talk on this subject too much, because I, I, I watched Facebook last week. And I see some of the wildest theology I've ever seen in my entire life on Facebook. And they are so convinced that what they say, that's the trouble with Facebook. Everybody's got a platform. <laughs> you can say anything. And everybody knows if it's on Facebook, it's got to be true, right? right. <laughs> but anyway, don't get your theology from Facebook. Please, call your pastor, call somebody. But call a knowledgeable friend, but don't get it from Facebook because... I'm, I've never seen such strange doctrine in all my life. But they're so adamant about it. It reminds me of Jennifer with her directional impairment. We had a traveling ministry and we're both directionally impaired. Neither one of us knows. But Jennifer was so prophetic. We would pull in a gas station and I'd go, which way did we come from? That way or that way? And Jennifer would go, that way. And when someone says that, you think they really know what they're talking about, right? That way. She was wrong 50% of the time. I said, I could have done that. <laughs> so discernment means go with your gut. And I'm going, she goes that way. And I'm going, I don't feel that. I don't think so. See, that's where, that's where you, when you love your wife, you get all confused. Because, <laughs> oh, I want to believe the sweet thing. She's got, she, she says it with such authority, but you know, in here it was, nee. you have to learn to go with the, eh. this knows truth from error, right from wrong. And you're going to have to do this because this up here will argue. This thinks it has a better idea. Just like Ford Motors, Ford, they had a better idea. Yep. All right. The next God tools. Actually, you know, salvation tracks. Any of you seen tracks when you were a young Christian? Maybe you passed them out. Actually, that could be a God tool used in a right way. Some people need it laid out. They're going, I, I want it. I want this Jesus, you know. You know, well, first, A, ask him into your heart. B, believe. C, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. All right, I could actually see where... That could be a God tool. I could see where it could help. But ultimately, it still has to be an encounter and a subsequent relationship. We use a blue card. And we've seen people get major deliverance and healing. And by the way, when it comes to deliverance, I've seen the best deliverance in the church in 44 years through people who learned to close the door to emotional wounding and seen it lift without even addressing it. Why? Because the will, the emotion, and the mind, all three were cooperating with the power of the Holy Spirit. I've seen people try to do deliverance on somebody who wasn't willing. <laughs> good, good luck. <laughs> you, you, could, you could work up a sweat and nothing's going to happen. Or you could possibly push it, the darkness away momentarily, but then it comes back. It's up to them and their will to properly surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. You can't make anybody be a Christian. You can't, otherwise we'd walk around, make everybody, get everybody that's unsaved saved. You will be saved because I said so. Yeah. I break that unsaved off of you. It isn't going to work. <laughs> they have a will. How does God communicate to us? Well, obviously, primarily through the scriptures, right? And the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Even the creation, he declares himself. The audible voice of God. I've had that. I've had dreams and visions. I've had visions that were in my mind's eye. 
but I have visions where my eyes were wide open. I have much more confidence in those. Um, I've had supernatural dreams, uh, blue card, but you know what? The primary way is a moment by moment relationship that's still the most fulfilling, not waiting from one experience to the next experience. That's not living the Christian life. Go to this conference, to that conference. Remember in the day, it used to be conference junkies. You know, it was basically looking for a touch rather than an encounter and a progressive relationship. Circumstances, sometimes coincidences. God can speak through circumstances. He can speak through all kinds of things. But basically, here's another one that I, I find missing when we travel when we to different churches. Did you, where's your conscience? Don't point to your temple. Your conscience is not in your head. Your conscience is here. If you do something wrong, you go, eh, you feel that in the gut. And no, I heard somebody do this on Facebook. Oh, my goodness. No, Jesus is not in your stomach. But what they fail to understand is your conscience is here, the door of the heart here. It's the seat of the emotions. Your spirit goes head to toe. But this is the epicenter. The conscience is in the gut and in the gut area, not in your you own head. But does that mean we have Jesus in our stomach? Okay, I'd like to disciple that person because... They really are a little bit on the clueless side. Um, when I drop down, the only thing I ever feel is hungry. We even had someone say that one. All right. That is not spiritual perception. <laughs> there is a difference. But conscience is the voice of your spirit. And it, you, it depends a lot on your word level, though. It's, it's reliable to... A point but you might need more light and by discernment one time I was praying with someone and they went whoosh and the anointing was there that you could bear witness to them being uh, slayed out in the spirit there was a Baptist minister that came to see me in this meeting and right when that person went whoosh, I could feel him go <clears throat> What, did, what do you think he was thinking when he got, <clears throat> I got a bad witness on that? That's what he was thinking. See, prejudice and a bad witness, the prejudice is based on your preconceived notion of what you think is right and scriptural. And so I came up to him later and I said, uh, when that, that fellow fell down, I said, I felt the peace of God and the anointing, but I felt you had a different reaction. And he goes, and I said, by what faculty did I know you had a different reaction? When we talked about discerning of spirits. And he admitted then that would have been a prejudice, not a bad witness. Isn't that interesting? So you can use it as a teaching tool but that conscience in here, you don't override it. You override it, you start putting pillows on your conscience. There'll be things that should have bothered you that don't bother you anymore. That is how to make ready of people prepared. That's an area that's going to have to change. You agree? Mm-hmm. We say, Holy Spirit, and by the way, this book will do it. The Didache. I'm telling you, seriously. Chapter 1 of the training manual for a new believer. First two verses. Love your enemies. Speak good things about people who speak bad about you. This is lesson number one, day one. Fast for your enemies. I shared that with Sid. Sid goes, I don't even think people fast for their friends. <laughs> you get alone there. Fast for your enemy. This is baby Christians. Oh, don't raise your hand. But how many of you have fasted for your enemy? Mm -hmm. Right? That's day one. These Messianic Jews who found Jesus were training these culturally weird Gentiles who know nothing, and they're saying, fast and pray for your enemies. This is your first class. Oh, some of them probably never went to the class, too. 
Oh, that's too hard. You have no idea what my enemies are like. Matter of fact, you don't even know what my mother-in-law is like, yet alone my enemies. Holy mackerel, you want me to fast for them? Yeah. Because if you only love those that love you, what good is it? Any evil person can love them that love them. That's not a big major trait. Oh, your conscience is the voice of your spirit. It's the inner assurance of peace. And again, if you know of a friend, I don't care how long they've been in the church, and they struggle with, am I saved or not? They want to go to the altar and get saved every time they sin. They want to beat themselves or whatever. Have them close their eyes, put their hand right down here in the epicenter, the seat of the emotions, the place of the conscience, the place of the will, and then whisper, while they're in an attitude of prayer, whisper, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me, that I should be called a child of God. If that feels good, you are a child of God. Now, if that feels creepy, we're going to pray a sinner's prayer with you because the only way, if you're called a child of God and it feels creepy, then you probably never had a supernatural conversion. You probably just had mental ascent and hung around the church. Remember in Module 1, Jennifer? Every, all the guys talked about this one is because we had someone that was in the church for 20-some years. And we had him drop down. I used him as an illustration. I said, how does that feel? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon me, that I should be called a child of God. He goes, not good. 20-some years in the church. That didn't feel good. He felt a, eh. So we had him say a sinner's prayer. And the glow of God came on his face and the men were all coming out of the restroom laughing. He was standing in front of the mirror smiling at himself. He was so happy. Oh boy, he, did. he got saved after 20 years in the church. He probably felt like his face was going to break. He was so happy. How many feel like you need to learn the God tools? Learn it a little better. Help these new people coming in. Because this is, this is the how-to to what they already know they're supposed to do. They can read their Bible and say, I'm supposed to do this, I'm supposed to do that. James says this, and uh, Paul says this, and Peter says this. I need to do these things. But the heart, the number one rule in real estate is location, location, location. That same principle applies to spiritual growth. When you locate the heart, the belly is the location of our entire emotional and spiritual heart life. And here's a verse of scripture from John 7:38. Out of your belly will flow rivers that if anyone comes to me and drink, like a fountain springing up. Where is it? It's not springing down. It's not flowing down. It's springing up into eternal life. It's down coming up. And I like this one. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. Flashlight, lamp, candle, different translations. But this basically the spirit of man, and it searches all the innermost rooms of the belly. When you close your eyes and say, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts, hurtful choices, basically you're letting the Holy Spirit search with his flashlight. And if he picks on something like, you've never really forgiven your father. Ooh. He found that with his flashlight. That's not man search, that's God searched. Search me, O oh God, for anxious, what kind of thoughts? Anxious. You better get rid of the anxious or you're not going to change the thought. Anxious thoughts, what kind of choices? Hurtful choices. You're not going to get rid of the bad choices until you deal with the hurt. Many of your decisions are coming from a place of hurt. I've seen people that were so in love with revenge, they didn't want to forgive. They liked the uh, the adrenaline rush that revenge had in it. That's pretty sad, isn't it? To feel addicted to an adrenaline rush of revenge. Well, ultimately, that'll take you down physically. That'll rob your physical health. Now, the heart, the spirit of man is a lamp of the Lord searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. What's it say about a gossip? We just did this one on Facebook Live with Sid. What does it say about gossip? The words of a gossip. First you come in here. 
are like tasty morsels. They have a seducing spirit on it. There's lust on it. it it's tickle. You wouldn't want to hear gossip if it didn't have a tickle. And are like tasty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Well, what happens when a, a gossip, a word, like a tasty morsel, it was tasty just like a fish once bait that's appealing, but then it's on a hook. So where's the hook now? Well, the gossip went down here, and it's down here, and now your eyes will perceive based on the poison that's on the gossip. So you're not seeing with the eyes of Jesus. You're seeing through a, a, a lens that has been dulled by the poison that was attached to the gossip. I so admired Jennifer when she was a baby Christian. She was part of an intercessory group. And the pastor didn't know what that was. And he, he changed later. But at first he says, all them people that are praying, that, that's witchcraft. I, I want them to stop praying. That intercessory prayer stuff, it's like witches. And she was a baby Christian, and she was so hurt. But she had an unsaved husband that said, you go get religious on me, and I'll divorce you. And she went home, and she just prayed and released forgiveness to that pastor. She didn't leave the church. My big baby, snowflakes. No, she was tough. She goes, I don't care if he said he divorced me. I'm reading my Bible, and I'm praying anyway. I'm not afraid of him. She ain't afraid of me either. She wasn't afraid of him, that unsaved guy. And she blessed that minister. Her husband got cancer and died. And before he died, she never talked about that pastor to her unsaved husband. And that unsaved husband had a word from the Lord, which he did change his mind on intercession later. But anyway, can you imagine being a baby Christian and someone calling you a witch? It would hurt right? And he got a word from the Lord to drive all the way up to Emory Hospital, the pastor. No, not, no. Okay. I should make sure I tell the story, right? The pastor got a word from the Lord to drive up to Emory Hospital where Jennifer's late husband was dying of cancer and he led him to the Lord six days before he died. And my thought was, and Jennifer's thought was later, I am so glad that I didn't badmouth that pastor to my late husband because he's the one that led him to the Lord. And you think, if you hear that gossip and that poison is down here, and you see according to that, oh, yeah, this guy wants to pray for me. This is the guy that called my wife a witch. It makes you wonder if he'd have been saved or not. So there's a redemptive approach to using the God tools properly and just dealing between you and God and letting love flow even toward your enemies. The grace of yielding is going to be a truth that is going to have to be taught. And if you want to teach somebody the grace of yielding, where their will is located, we used to have them stand against the wall in churches, have them go all the way around the church to stand against the wall. To show them that their will was here is to fall backwards about six inches from the wall. In order to fall backwards, it, it's unnatural. You have to release your will to do it. And you can feel that as you release your will, peace increases proportionally. What would that tell you scripturally? If yielding my will causes peace to increase, I'm yielding, not to man, I'm yielding to the Jesus in me, then peace increases proportionally to my surrender. What do they say at, at, at evangelistic crusades? I surrender all. Don't they even sing that song a lot of times for an altar call? I surrender all. Surrender or yield is the key to the ascendancy of lordship. He might be your savior, but unless you're walking in peace, he's not lord. Let the peace of God rule. 
Well, he himself is my peace. I think you've had enough for one day. I think that most of you look at the cross-eyed. So, but isn't this helpful to know how you can help someone else with the how-tos? Because they can know their Bible inside out and backwards. They can have come from wonderful churches. But the one missing ingredient for such a time as this, and long after I'm with Jesus, I know our books are going to help people with, well, how do I do what you're saying? How do I surrender? How do I yield better? How do I do it? You, in fact, just like my pastor, should be able to help people. You should be able to answer the simplest questions. <clears throat> and don't worry about how popular they are. I know someone on the West Coast, the world-renowned speaker and prophet, and his pastor said, just forgive and live with the pain. And that's a quality pastor. So apparently there is a lack of understanding of the supernatural transaction for not only salvation, but for repentance and forgiveness. A supernatural exchange will always result in peace. Be anxious for nothing but by prayer. That means anxiousness is not an attitude of prayer. Search me, O God, for anxious thoughts. It's a form of fear. You cannot be trusting God and anxious at the same time. You can't be trusting God and stress. That's for the benefit of men. Men don't use emotions. Men use stress. That's more masculine. I'm stressed. I'm not emotional. Stress means you're being emotionally controlled by people and circumstances. <laughs> so I know you don't have any emotions because you're a man. <clears throat> Jennifer says that means they don't have any good ones. Because we've seen them on the road, and we know they have emotion. Right? All right. Father, equip us for the days ahead to not only move more effectively in practicing the presence of God, but also learn and be trained in the God tools that we might help people that are struggling and make it easier rather than harder. Rather than watching them suffer for weeks and months and go around the mountain a million times with something that could be resolved quite easily, help me explain the how-to tools for them, the God tools, to bring every loose thought, emotion, and impulse captive to a structure of a life shaped by Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Again. Forgive, one, two, three, get the special. This is not only the how-to book for the future, but if you look for the special on forgive123.com, you also get your choice of two other books as long as until they last. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.